Good day. My name is Katrina Carlton, and my group members, Joseph Charles, Shaquille Antoine, Kalisha Collins, and Nalini Sukram Ramkisun, and I are here to talk about gender, particularly how the focus on women's rights and the fight for equality affects men. So, equality. Equality is the right of a group of individuals to receive the same treatment as another group of individuals. And gender equality in turn refers to men and women being treated and regarded in the same way in society. So, most people believe that patriarchy is the root of gender equality and in some cases they aren't wrong. Patriarchy is defined as male domination in social or cultural systems. So, sociobiology argues that it's inevitable, patriarchy that is, because men are generally more likely to be the ones hunting and hence more in control of life within society, whereas women tend to be more geared towards child rearing. However, the social constructionist theory argues that gender roles are defined by society and can change over time depending on whether persons choose to accept or contest them. So in the past, Women never had the right to own property. Their fathers and later their husbands were in charge of the estates and finances. And should something happen to a husband, the estate would either fall to the eldest son if he was of legal age or the closest male relative. So an uncle, a cousin, a grandfather, a brother. And in general, male children or sons were regarded with great esteem. It was a great accomplishment to have a son, while daughters were more like bargaining chips, essentially a commodity. They were married off to the man that made the highest offer, the highest um, offer for their hand. So marriage then turned into a business transaction. If a man married a wealthy woman, he would get everything that was entitled to her through her inheritance from her family. So any land that she owned, any um, finances that she owned, basically everything. And if a woman were to marry into a rich family, her family will be paid a handsome dowry for her hand, essentially selling her to her husband. So it wasn't until the 1800s that we started seeing some serious progress with regards to women's rights. In 1839, Mississippi became the first U.S. state to allow women the right to vote. And in the late 1800s, women were beginning to be allowed to practice law. They were beginning to be involved in politics. In the 1900s, women were finally able to control their own finances, to own their own properties, to have the right to choose when and if they wanted to have a child through the distribution of knowledge of birth control. They were allowed to vote across the board and they were beginning to break into male-dominated career fields like engineering and computer science and mathematics, things that women weren't really seen capable of in the past. Support systems began to be set up for victims of domestic violence as well. So in the 2000s, progress continued. A lot of laws were passed with regards to equal pay, or at least in to make attempts to equalize pay so that men and women in the same field with the same qualifications would be paid the same amount of money. They were able to pass a lot of, have a lot of laws passed with regards to discrimination in the workplace, making it 
a little bit more of an even playing field when it comes to being hired or maintaining a job or going up for a promotion because typically a man would be considered over a woman for those types of opportunities. They were also finally allowed to take up combat positions in the army. And some notable mentions of breakthroughs for women in Trinidad and Tobago are the election of our first female prime minister, Mrs. Kamala Pasar in 2010, and then this year, the election of our first female president, Paula May Weeks. From the introduction, we move to the freedom to break traditional male gender roles. Here we'll be looking at what are male gender roles and what happens when these traditions are broken. Now, when we speak about traditional male gender roles, we need to look at it at a holistic view, which is the patriarchal society. Now, if patriarchal is defined as a general structure in which men have power over women, then a patriarchal society consists of a male-dominated power structure throughout organized society and individual relationships. Now, there is a phenomena that fuels this type of society, which is called toxic masculinity. Now, what is toxic masculinity? Toxic masculinity can be defined as the constellation of socially regressive male traits that serve to foster domination, the devaluation of women, homophobia, and wanton violence. Now, how this phenomena affects men? Well, studies have shown that male suicide has increased 24% within the past 15 years, and it is linked to masculinity and the expectations of men. Now, in our own society, expectation of the male gender role is that men should be strong, not emotional, be into sports, always sexual, be the breadwinner of the household, be aggressive, or even being the higher paid gender. Now what happens if we include feminism? Well, feminism attacks all gender stereotypes, not just the ones that affect women. Feminism and gender equality is working to allow men to freely express their feelings and seek help when they need it. Now, some persons believe that feminism only benefits women, but truth and in fact, it also benefits men. Some positive effects men obtain through feminism are men get to spend more time with their children, boosted family income, which means men don't have to be the breadwinner of the household, increased purchasing power, which also stems from boosted family income, because with a boosted family income, that family as a unit Purchasing power will increase, thus less stress on the man. And lastly, contrary to beliefs, dividing household, household, household chores more equally between men and women has been proven to make men happier. And I must agree with that statement. <laughs> to end this section, I'd like to recite a quote from a former Prime Minister, Kamala Prasad Bisesa Upla, when she made commentary of the swanning in of our new president, Paula May Weeks. And I read, It is of our view that no society can achieve its potential until all women take up leadership roles and contribute as equals in advancing national development. Equity at all levels will enhance our democracy and ensure that our nation achieves its true potential. So, what is feminism? Feminism is defined as the belief that men and women should have equal political, social, and economic opportunities. Sexism refers to prejudice stemming from sex and or gender. And benevolent sexism refers to what society considers to be chivalrous behavior towards women that in actuality paints them as helpless and needing the protection of a man. Altruism refers to charitable acts performed out of concern for the welfare of others. So, some extremist feminists use benevolent sexism as a weapon to fight back as what they perceive to be the underlying result of society brainwashed by patriarchy. 
they lash out at men who may be genuinely trying to be helpful and label them as sexist. For example, a man opening a door for a woman whose hands are full or helping to lift a box that may cause injury should the woman try to lift it herself can then be misconstrued to be the man thinking that the woman was incapable of performing the task herself. So in turn, this blurring of lines between altruism and sexism has led to men becoming more wary of performing altruistic acts for women in fear of being labeled as a sexist because they have no idea who is going to be an extremist feminist or not. Hi, I'm Joseph and I'm here to speak about emasculation. What is emasculation? Emasculation can be defined as any activity or circumstance that intentionally or unintentionally strips a man of his manhood. The focus on women's rights has been empowering and motivating women to take on new responsibilities and explore new forms of freedom. However, studies have shown that as women become more independent and empowered, that some men are liable to feel emasculated. Today, many women are no longer waiting on men to provide while taking up responsibility as a provider. According to research done in 2015 by the Center for American Progress, women now contribute 50% of the household income and in most cases are the sole breadwinner in the home. Women are not just becoming breadwinners, but also taking up managerial positions in large companies. In the 1950s, the number of women in the workforce was recorded to be at 34%. Over the years, there has been a steady increase in women joining the workforce. As of statistics recording in 2016, this number now stands at 57%. Women are also carving out a space in Fortune 500 companies. From 2016 to 2017, the number of women CEOs has grown from 21 to 32, a whopping 50% increase. This trend has caused a deviation from the patriarchal system in which the man is the head and provider of the family. It creates an environment for women to compete with men for existence. According to Stephanie Kuntz, a renowned author and historian, emasculated men can sometimes turn to substance abuse as a means to escape the reality of feeling inadequate and unable to fulfill their gender role. I will now hand over to Nalini to speak about hypermasculinity. Good day, my name is Nalini Sukram Ramkisun and I'll be presenting on the topic of hypermasculinity. Now what is hypermasculinity? Hypermasculinity has been defined as an exaggeration of traditional male stereotypes that includes callous attitudes towards women and sexual behavior. Now, the perception of hypermasculinity is that violence is manly and that danger is exciting. It is the approach which states that macho men often see violence as an acceptable way to achieve power over women. Now, the real assertion of masculinity surrounds us and takes a multiplicity of forms, in that it is a direct and opposite response to feminism and the illusion of traditional male roles. Now, in many instances, the reassertion of masculinity is positive, for it is often an attempt to recast the male away from narrow categories of emotionally distant provider. But it is hypermasculine forms where gender confusion contributes to overcompensation in the forms of violence, misogyny, or homophobia. It underlines our most pressing social problems. Now, the main question is how has the focus on women's rights promoted hypermasculinity? The majority of discourse on gender oppression is made up of female experience, understandably so given the subjugation of women in the past. Now how can men be oppressed when it's men who are oppressive? Contrary to popular belief, men are just as victimized by the darker side of the gender as women. Their battle is less well known because it is weighed internally behind closed doors. Now most of the time, gender studies are centered on the woman's perspective following the early trends of feminism. However, 
feminism has evolved to be more inclusive of various intersecting identities while also focusing on the detrimental effects of hypermasculinity. For example, up until women's suffrage, a man was the head of his marriage and his household, and his vote represented not just himself but his entire family, including his wife and his children. Now, when men voted, they were conscious of the fact that they were voting not just for themselves and their own personal interests, but were also charged with the responsibility of deciding and making the decision about what was in the best interest of their family. So as soon as the 19th Amendment was passed, men were effectively castrated and in many cases disenfranchised by their wives. So no longer was the man the head of the household. No longer was he responsible for his wife. Now the wife was a quote-unquote co-husband and best or a flat-out adversary at worst. The notion of a man making the final decision about what was best for his wife and family for his God-given vocation as husband and father was now over. In light of the rights that women now possess, men are now permitted with characteristics such as lust to present sexual prowess, ratio show of strength, and bravado to display courage in order to achieve and maintain power over women. In conclusion, these are the ways in which the focus on women's rights has contributed directly to hypermasculinity in men. I now pass you on to my colleague, Kalisha, who will now continue with the presentation. So we hear the term woman empowerment used. What really is woman empowerment? Woman empowerment can mean different things to different people. However, if we have to sum it up, we can say it means equality. Some of the things that will come to mind are equal choices, equal freedom and opportunity, self-worth, and a brighter future for young girls. So why women empowerment? Well, firstly, it's one of the main steps towards the achievement of gender equality. You see, women now gets involved in matters of education as well as career activities outside of their domestic situation. Secondly, there's a positive impact on the economy and the environment. Countries, for example, who have opened up education to women and inducted them into their workforce have proven to progress much better economically than those who sought to keep women oppressed. Leaving one part of the population uneducated means you have created an inferior workplace that can ultimately cause a dampening effect on the economy. Thirdly, Diversification in the workplace is achieved, even breaking gender stereotype. There are various factors which show that diversification of gender in the workplace can yield exuberating results. Major studies conducted comparing the financial performance of companies with a large number of women on their boards to those who had little or no women proved that companies with strong representation of women outperform those companies in every respect. Fourthly, woman empowerment helps in the protecting of women's rights. You see, this is key to dismantle repressive regimes and institutions that can operate in society. Totalitarian ideologies, repressive governments, fundamentalist religion, despite their race or belief, all possess one common characteristic, which is to keep women in their place. This is also evident in some religions such as Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, and many others. These institutions are male-dominated and women have little or no voice. The meeting area where these institutions congregate became echo chambers in which the point of view of women were not acknowledged. Whether or not these fundamentalist regimes repress because of their desire to rule at all times, the problems that some women face in these forums not only affect them, but it can affect anyone who has to live with physical and psychological damage caused by such institutions and governments. Therefore, reform must take place within these systems. Women empowerment can also help solve population issues. There are some social problems that only women can solve, for example, overpopulation. For many years, some governments have implemented programs to reduce excessive birth rates, which undermine the economic well-being of the countries instead of bringing success. However, 
The only thing which brought effective change in this area was the empowering of women. As women, we became educated and gained economic and legal rights. The birth rates went to a, manage a manageable level. Men were not capable of doing this on their own, but it occurred only when the women were empowered to control their own bodies. Furthermore, on issues of child development, family health and income and other issues, women now possess the ability to act on their own on social rights and use their ingenuity to solve problems. Woman empowerment can also reduce crime levels, yes. With women being more educated and established persons in society, they are able to do a much better job at nurturing their children, therefore reducing the chances of delinquent children and youths who can turn to a life of crime, whereby increasing crime levels. Woman and empowerment, lastly, can increase this imposable income. With there being control in births within families, causing reduced family size, there will be more disposable income. More disposable income will result in lower poverty levels as there will be increase in spending power of families, allowing their standard of living to raise. As with everything, although the advantages are great, there are disadvantages to acknowledge as well. So some of the disadvantages of women empowerment are firstly lost of gender identity. There are distinct differences between men and women that makes each unique and should not be masked by equality measures. For example, women are better teachers while men are naturally physically stronger and so will be able to better execute certain tasks. Secondly, there's the feeling of entitlement by women. Due to this empowerment, some women may think that just because they are women, they should be allowed or respected regardless of their actions, which should not be so. There's a misconception of disempowerment by men. The misconception that empowering women means you're disempowering men is considered a myth. This is fueled by the concept that women will take control. You see, some men believe that if women are empowered, they will take control over them, which is not true. Therefore, we need to eliminate this misconception if we are to achieve gender equality. Woman empowerment is a collective effort and men play a crucial role in this as woman empowerment not only benefits women but the well-being of all of society. There's also the concept that men will be disempowered. Empowering one gender does not disempower the other. It empowers all, in fact. Empowering women empowers men, children, families and ultimately the entire society. So to sum it up, gender equality is attainable as well as other global goals and it is through us who are aware to let those who are not aware know that governments and private sector play a crucial role in the achievement of global goals and through global citizenship, advocacy, trainings, outreach and partnership, we can achieve all these goals. Woman empowerment is not only a human right but it is also a pathway to achieving gender equality. So in conclusion, the fight for equality has had both positive and negative effects on men. It has given them the freedom to break gender roles, led to them being unsure of where the boundaries for sexism lie, led to them feeling emasculated, led to them turning to hyper-masculine behaviors in an attempt to regain their masculinity, and given them the misconception that the empowerment of females leads to the disempowerment of males.